Olá, pessoal. Está todo mundo me ouvindo, bem, me vendo direitinho, tudo certo? É a primeira vez que estamos usando essa plataforma. Então, não sei se está... Deem um oi aí, se está tudo certo. Acho que sim, né? É... Bom, gente, desculpa aí o atraso, mas... É... Acho que foi, como eu mencionei, né, um bom motivo. A professora Wendy é, foi tomar a segunda dose da vacina. E aí teve um acidente na estrada, enfim, mas ela já está aqui. É, então, vai começar. É, eu vou só fazer inicialmente uma apresentação aqui do evento, falar um pouquinho sobre ela, e aí a gente começa, tá bom? É... Bom, gente, em primeiro lugar, né, estou muito feliz de estar aqui hoje, dando início a essa programação, é, muito animada com todo mundo que está aqui assistindo. Meu nome é Maria Visconti, para quem não me conhece, eu sou doutoranda em História pelo FMG e sou uma das coordenadoras aqui do NEPAT, o Núcleo de Estudos e Pesquisas sobre Autoritarismo e Totalitarismo da UFMG. E hoje a gente vai dar início ao evento internacional O que Resta da Suástica, Nazismo, Negacionismo e Memória, que é um evento que tem por objetivo trazer algumas reflexões e debates sobre os perigos das permanências da ideologia e do discurso nazista na atualidade, e também construir algumas discussões aí em torno do Terceiro Reich, pensando em novas abordagens e caminhos de compreensão. De novo, estou muito feliz de estar aqui falando sobre isso. Vou dar algumas informações aqui muito rapidamente, antes da gente começar. É, essa conferência vai ser realizada em inglês, e depois a gente vai disponibilizar uma versão com legenda em português para ficar mais acessível, tá? É, a gente vai abrir para perguntas após o término da fala da professora, e as perguntas vocês podem enviar aqui pelo chat do YouTube. Vocês podem enviar tanto em inglês quanto em português, não faz diferença, e elas serão repassadas para a palestrante. E a gente vai mandar aqui no chat do YouTube, não sei se as meninas já colocaram, é, o formulário de presença. Ele vai ficar sendo passado aqui no chat do YouTube, e através desse formulário que a gente vai fazer a conferência da presença. Lembrando que para vocês ganharem o certificado de ouvinte com 25 horas, vocês precisam participar de 50% das atividades do evento. Ou seja, comparecer em quatro das oito mesas. E aí vocês vão receber o certificado em até 30 dias após o fim do evento, tá bom? Então vamos lá. É a conferência de hoje, a conferência de abertura do nosso evento, denominada As Mulheres do Nazismo, Espectadoras, Colaboradoras e Perpetradoras, tem como objetivo apresentar a participação das alemãs dentro do regime nazista e a sua atuação nos territórios ocupados no leste, pensando nas suas diversas contribuições para o regime, como professoras, secretárias, enfermeiras e esposas. Nem todas se tornaram perpetradoras, mas ignorar a atuação dessas mulheres que participaram da máquina genocida limita severamente a nossa compreensão do holocausto. A nossa palestrante de hoje é a professora Wendy Lauer, que obteve o título de bacharel na Hamilton College, de doutora pela American University. Ela é professora da cadeira de história na John K. Roth, da faculdade Claremont McKenna, na Califórnia. É também diretora do Centro Magrubian pelos Direitos Humanos, nessa mesma instituição, e diretora do Comitê Acadêmico do Museu Memorial do Holocausto de Washington. Atualmente, ela está em sabático, atuando como pesquisadora sênior William Rosenberg, na Universidade de Yale. O Andy é especialista nos estudos sobre o Holocausto, o genocídio e sobre direitos humanos. E ela é autora do livro Hitler's Furies, German Women in the Nazi in Killy Fields, que foi publicado em português e foi traduzido como As Mulheres no Nazismo, que estou aqui fazendo um jabazinho né, básico. É, então, eu vou agora apresentar a professora em inglês, e aí a gente vai dar início, tá bom? É, today will host the opening conference of the events What is Left of the Swastika, Nazism, Negationism and Memory, organized by the coordinations of the Center of Studies and Researches on Authoritarianism and Totalitarianism. The goal of the event is to foster reflections about the dangers of the permanence of the Nazi ideology and discourse in the present days, as well as to better understand the Third Reich, this past that won't pass. The conference that will be held in today is called Women of Nazi Germany, bystanders, collaborators, and perpetrators, and intends to show the participation of German women in the Nazi regime and their role in the occupied territories in the East, considering their help in the regime as teachers, secretaries, nurses, and wives. Not all of them become perpetrators, but to ignore the ones who did would severely impact our understanding of the Holocaust. The conference will be held by Professor Wendy Lauer. 
Wendy Lauer is the John K. Roth Professor of History at Claremont McKenna College and the director of the McGrublin Center for Human Rights at the same institution. She chairs the academic committee of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. She is also the writer of Hitler's Furies, German Women in the Nazi Killing Fields, which was translated to Portuguese. Professor Wendy, we are very happy mm -hmm. and honored to present you today. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Please, you can have the words and you can start mm. the presentation. Take as long as you need. No, oh, thank you so much. And thank you all for your patience. I'm so sorry I got stuck in traffic. Um, I couldn't control it and it just, I, I really uh, regret it. And I uh, thank you for your, um, for tolerating that and for hanging in there and waiting for the presentation. So thank you, thank you. And thank you, Maria, for organizing this. Um, this is a real honor. I'm excited about your conference and about your interest in women in Nazi Germany and a better understanding of fascism um, and how it um, involves all sectors of society, men, women, and, and youth too, as, as, as we will probably talk about a little bit today. So let's start with the first slide. I don't know if Maria, if you can pull that up and we're gonna go through, I'm gonna tell you a little bit, some highlights from Hitler's Furies and share with you my process of discovery in the book and how I came to write it and what some of the main findings are in the book. Um, so uh, it actually started in the early 90s when the Soviet Union collapsed. And there were these kinds of documents that I was finding in the former Soviet archives because they were suddenly accessible. And I made my way to Ukraine in the summer of 1992. I went to Ukraine because Hitler and Himmler had their headquarters there. It was the um, every fourth victim um, we now know um, who died in the Holocaust, died on the territory, uh, uh, it was residing in what is the territory of Ukraine today. So I went to Ukraine and I um, was poking around the archives and looking in the archives and discovering um, documents that showed that women, ordinary German women, were in these Eastern territories in what Timothy Snyder calls the bloodlands of the Holocaust. And that just gave me reason to pause because the literature had been placing them at home, um, keeping down the home front and um, not um, embroiled in the actual uh, massacres in the Eastern territories. And so um, these kinds of documents were turning up. This, this, this actually is a German document. Um, there's the word Geheim there. Um, but it is an order, um, it's a list of, of, of female personnel. You can see one, two, three, four, is it Fräulein, FRL, that's the abbreviation, Frau Berger. So these are women working in an office. These are the secretaries and telephone operators who in this case, on this document, are stationed in Riga in Latvia. Um, they're managing um, the deportations, the ghetto, um, uh, in Riga itself, um, and you know, kind of the disposition, um, dispensation of the of the Jewish population, what's going to happen um, to the Jewish population, and implementing what the Nazis call the final solution. So the importance of this document, just to give you an example, is to place women, ordinary clerks, um, secretaries, administrators in the um, eastern territories of the Holocaust outside the camp system. Um, in the mass shootings and in the ghetto liquidations um, that started in the summer of 1941 in, in these parts. Um, and here they are, and there are two of them that are Fräulein, so that indicates they're single. And indeed, most of the women who were sent to the Eastern territories to fulfill their labor obligation, or they went out of all different reasons, opportunism, uh, better salary, better pay, um, uh, because they were uh, ideologically committed and wanted to go east and be part of this revolution and part of this campaign. Um, but most of them were um, single women between the ages of 18 and 25. Um, and we're going to talk about that in a moment, what that means as far as a kind of generational cohort that came of age during the Nazi era. So I just initially found this material, but it was not a book yet um, because you don't you can't write women's history from one, set of files or documents, you have to piece it together from a lot of different sources. So it requires quite a bit of detective work. And um, if you go to the next slide, um, you will see uh, on the next slide, a photograph. Um, Maria, I don't know if you can go to the next slide. Uh, forward, thank you. So another way to try to uncover these stories and to find the women 
in the Holocaust, um, ordinary German women is to women is to look at their photo the photographs. It's one of the most photographs war and indeed one of the most photographed um, genocide in history. And so in these images, we see women. In this case, we have, and this was a book that had been around for decades and is widely used. Um, and here we see a group photograph from um, the camp of um, Treblinka and the commandant is there and there's a woman right in the, you know, in the group and it says unknown German woman. Um, but th these were the women I was trying to identify, like who, who is that woman and why is she um, carousing out these um, SS guards and, and indeed the commandant, um, Franz Stangl is in the photo down below, the commandant of Sobibor uh, is seated there. Uh, next slide, please. And so th that the the effort was to um, what I embarked on was not only to find the women in the sources and to identify them and to try to figure out what brought them to the eastern territories, what did they witness, how did they respond um, if they encountered um, uh, these anti-Jewish actions, these ghetto liquidations, and to what what roles would they have potentially played um, in the Holocaust at the actual crime scenes. And when I looked into the terrain of the bloodlands of the massacre sites, this is what we're talking about here. This is kind of geographic orientation here of um, the Baltics and Ukraine and Poland and Belarus. And, um, you know, scholars now have started to tabulate the um, compare kind of the killing actions outside the gassing facilities. And it's almost close to half of the Jews who died in the Holocaust died in these outside the actual um, gassing facilities. So that's that's really the focus of the book is, is those crimes and um, the possibility that women might encounter them because they're, they're happening in broad daylight. They're happening in these um, rural uh, settings in what was the former Soviet Union and what the Germans called the Lebensraum. This was going to be their big colonial project in the Eastern territories. Um, it was Hitler's dream to turn this into a kind of utopia, a German only, an Aryan only utopia, which was predicated on the destruction of, of their kind of racial enemies and inferiors, which was going to amount to tens of millions of deaths of Slavic, what they called Untermenschen, um, but also the Jews were their primary um, target in embarking on this colonial genocide. So this is, this is the terrain here, this continental empire they're trying to create. Um, the next slide. This is one of the figures in the book. This is Erna Petrie. And before I get into her story, because it's going to be one of the, the themes today, one of the highlights of, of, the, um, of, of the research in Hitler's Furies, uh, I want to step back just for a moment. And if you think about um, in your own uh, reading of the Holocaust or teaching, um, what emerges in your mind as far as the typical female portrait of a, of a German woman or of a female German perpetrator. Because as I started to go into the regular published literature, it wasn't really squaring with, it wasn't quite matching up with what I was finding in the archives. So in the archives, uh, women were primary witnesses to the Holocaust. Um, in these various roles as teachers, as secretaries, as the spouses of SS officers and the wives of, of commandants and order policemen. So the wives of, of the killers, the main killers. And I do not make the argument that women were the main killers. Um, some went on like this woman right here to kill um, with, her, with her bare hands in, in a horrific um, case that she was, uh, she was prosecuted in 1961. And this is the file here. But most of the women, what I found to be the important discovery were um, besides witnesses, so they couldn't deny um, after the war that they didn't know what was going on or even during the war. But, but um, women were incredibly important as the administrators, as the um, uh, uh, implementers of the Nazi policy. It's a state-sponsored campaign, government-sponsored, and these women are very much the operatives, especially as the war continues and the able-bodied men are brought into military service. And in the literature, you know, there was not, that wasn't represented. I mean, the, the, the literature on, on German um, male perpetrators was becoming increasingly nuanced and um, going into very um, detailed descriptions of ordinary men, of, of technocrats, of plunderers, of the doctors, so the professions were all under kind of the microscope, but the same kind of scrutiny had not been applied 
to research on female perpetrators. Instead, we ended up with this very polarized, um, extreme, in some ways, in some cases, like caricatures of of um, of women who were like sex starved camp guards, the uh, mayor of Maidanek. Uh, they had these names, uh, Herm Hermana Braunsteiner or the beautiful beast of Belzen or Magreza. And so the media had sensationalized their violence and located its evil as Claudia Kunz, famous historian observed, they locate evil in these sexual urges or the kind of eroticized um, impulses of women. So that was the ex explanation for female um, perpetrators that they were driven by these sexual urges. So that was one side of the portrait. The other side of the portrait of ordinary German women that was dominant was women as nurturers, as caregivers, as innocent, um, as um, not um, involved, as morally kind of upstanding and um, fitting a kind of gendered uh, stereotype of, of women as the gentler, as the gentler sex. Um, but when we leave women in that sphere of, of the innocent, um, what we do is we take them in historian Ann Taylor Allen's words, words, while they remain in that sphere, they are endowed with the innocence of the crimes of the modern state. And what happens is we, we leave them outside of modernity. We leave them outside of history as, as long as we keep them in that, um, in that space of, of, of purity and of innocence, which is really a lot of what the Nazi propaganda was trying to push Goebbels and his um, organization. And so in some ways we're kind of duped or <laughs> kind of tricked by Nazi um, propaganda because I mean, the reality is that by 1935, most um, ordinary German women were not married, uh, were not constantly pregnant and not staying at home. In fact, they were very important for this um, as agents of a conservative racist um, revolution. They were full-fledged Aryan members of Hitler's fascist society. They were political despite themselves. And they came, these, these ordinary women who um, came of age in the 30s, they were mostly born after the Second World War. And this is why it's a generational story as well, were the first to go through the Nazi school system. And so they really show us, you know, how far the system could, could go. Um, through its education, the fact that all the young girls had to had by the time they were ten years old, they were forced into the um, German youth movement for girls, for instance, that was compulsory. Um, so they're kind of coming through this system and then being sent out into the into the world of the war and the Holocaust. And the big question is, what what are they going to do with that indoctrination, with that coming of age story in in Hitler's um, regime. And here's this one case that I found in 2005 that really convinced me to write this book. Um, and that's Erna Petrie. And if you look, can look closely, the, the date on this interrogation is 1961. So it's actually August 61, the Berlin Wall is being um, established, being erected. It's right. Uh, the Cold War is heating up. Um, can you go to the next slide? Um, and the case of Erna Petrie, she, in that document, that interrogation, she confesses to shooting Jewish boys on their, on her farm in Western Ukraine. Um, and I'm going to go back to that case in a moment because it's the most extreme, but it's also extremely <laughs> revealing. Um, but um, she was not alone. As I mentioned, she's part of this generation. And uh, as an illustration of that, I wanted to show you this image of the nurses being sworn in. So to think about all the different female professions that are um, marshaled and and brought in to um, serve this this the regime and also um, implement these horrific criminal policies. So there we have the nurses who were involved in the um, euthanasia program, the so-called T4 program. And one of the cases in my book, Paulina Kneisler, comes through the medical profession and is responsible for administering lethal injections. Um, um, up to 70 per day at the height of her, of her killing um, period during the war, uh, working at Kaufbeuren, at Hadamar, and the various facilities in Nazi Germany. In fact, she was such a fanatic, uh, she was still administering these lethal injections after the Allies had, after the surrender of the Nazi regime and, the, um, and during the, the first weeks of the American occupation of Bavaria, she was still working in Kaufbeuren um, and administering these lethal injections. Uh, so that's how far she was going to go. 
Uh, next slide, please. The presence of women, um, and this is an, uh, an illustration of the women who, the nurses, again, who are in the battle zones here. This is Hitler, um, right? Shortly after the invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941, this is August 41. A few weeks later, the Jews of Berdichev are going to be ghettoized and the mass shootings of those Jews up to 15,000 are going to, is, is going to start in mid-September, so about a month after this. But just to show you that um, the women are deliberately kind of in the middle of the action here, being photographed with Hitler and showing off their kind of patriotic service. Uh, next slide. Okay, so the women of this era, um, it's not only a generational story as I was uh, just referring to, but there's something kind of um, interesting about something, the hybridity as far as what kind of woman is emerging at this time when it is the era of the first success, the first wave of success in the um, kind of feminist movement or at least the suffragette movement um, in succeeding in getting the vote after the First World War here in Germany as well in the Soviet Union, the United States. And so they're entering into the public sphere, into the political sphere, going to the voting booths in, in the Weimar um, elections, joining political parties, including obviously the Nazi party, um, learning about the party platform, including whether it's anti-Semitic or it's the Catholic Center Party. But this is their awakening and they're coming out of that private um, uh, domain, uh, which I described earlier as the historian described as a kind of domain of innocence. Now they're coming out into the public um, uh, public square and politicking. And here we can see how this kind of combines into an act, an active, politically active, engaged party member. This is Erna Patrie during the 1930s. This is from her personal photo album. And it's just striking that she's on this um, motorcycle, um, you know, which is obviously uh, the new uh, uh, vehicle for speed and um, even a kind of liberation or independence. Her husband was part of the automobile club. And so they're very excited. Now she's sitting on this, but she's straddling it. Um, and she's also wearing her apron and she's got her hair pulled up in a bun. So she's this combination of a kind of woman who's part of this radical revolution, but she is conforming to the stereotypes of women as a kind of housefrau, as kind of domesticated women. But the, but the two can coexist. They're kind of coming together in this in this um, chapter, this historical chapter of the Nazi regime. Uh, next slide. So I wanted to just touch on a couple of cases to give you some highlights of the different reactions, which were varied. Um, Erna Petrie on one extreme who responded violently. And this is a nurse um, who was educated. She actually had a law degree. And um, she, during the war is is really conflicted. And, and when I interviewed her, she said, oh, what could I do? I, I you know, it was just this one person working in this remote um, uh, soldier's home in, in Ukraine and, She's learning um, about all the details of, of, of the Holocaust, uh, the mass shootings in the region, including in the town where she is here in Novgorod, Volinsk. Um, the men here that she's working in this, she's serving them in this home. Um, she's supposed to be, she's not doing any kind of medical, uh, she didn't actually undergo any real medical training. She's just supposed to be kind of a socialite um, to serve German food and speak German and give them that cultural experience while they're um, not at home, while they're on their way to the front. Um, and when they're coming back, and these, this is just a, a, a retreat, a, a gathering, a social space. But in that space, they're sharing a lot of stories with her and, and, and vivid details about these um, about these mass shootings as, as they um, actually carried them out some, in some cases. And she um, told me, Annette Schultz told me that oftentimes conversations with these soldiers got personal fast. They hadn't been around women for a while um, and they had this intense need to talk. So the women are not only witnesses to these crimes, um, but they're kind of the vessels that are receiving this information. Um, and in this case, Annette is jotting it down and taking notes and has this sense of justice already from her law degree. And she would, after the war, pursue this. Um, she was the head of the West German um, Female um, Association of Judges, uh, which was a new organization. So she was rather pioneering in that way, a real leader. Um, but she was feeding the information, giving the information to prosecutors um, in West Germany um, as she encountered some former perpetrators and also these um, 
notes that he had, she had taken during the war and, and letters that she had written. So she wrote a letter to her um, mother in November 41. She'd only been um, uh, on, in the Eastern Front for a few months. Um, and she wrote in November, what Papa says is true. People with no moral inhibitions exude a strange odor. I can now pick out these people and many of them really do smell like blood. Oh, what an enormous slaughterhouse the world is. And that is an important example of how women responded to the violence in this way. In her, in her case, she felt really paralyzed by it, um, that she didn't have a choice and she continued with her service. Um, actually, she went into, into Russia from there. She couldn't go back. Um, but it is also an important example of the um, importance of biography in studying this in, in, the, in the sense that she changed um, during the course of the war and that her post-war period was this other much larger chapter of the pursuit of justice, that the Holocaust years were one part of her life. And um, in Hitler's Furies, it's 13 biographies. And I, the reason why I chose that structure was to um, actually show readers how these individuals changed over time um, when this, you know, in, in, um, in their growing up in the system, in their uh, uh, adult, young adulthood as professionals in the system. And then after the war, uh, once the system collapsed, you know, how did they adapt to um, a world without, without Hitler? Next slide. Um, the example in the book, uh, there are several, but this one is is rather striking and of a secretary in Lida in Belarus. Um, and there are a couple of reasons why I um, want to show this example to you today. One is that the person who is uh, the focus, her name is Lizalota Meyer. She was trained as an accountant, um, actually living near Dresden, and had the opportunity to go to Belarus. The salary was better. And she went to the orientation um, in Minsk, and she met her boss. And there he is, this, this man here, his name is um, Hanveg, uh, Hermann Hanveg, and that's his family. And this is a family wartime photo. Um, he's in uniform. And the entire family was living in a kind of German-only colony kind of community in, in Lida, a town that had... Uh, about 6,000 Jews, um, and he was responsible for the region, for making the region what they called Judenfrei, free of Jews, and that amounted to about 12,000 Jews. Um, and he's there with his family. Um, if you could go to the next slide. Here is, here is Lizalota, his secretary. Um, these are all personal photos from the war that were um, collected by uh, investigators. This was part of an investigation of the killers in Lizalota's office and Lisa Lota was also interrogated after the war and questioned about her boss, Herman Hanveig. It was an interesting interrogation or an interesting um, testimony because it turned out that Lisa Lota Meyer was having a very um, intense relationship and affair with her boss. Um, and uh, I, I bring that up because a lot of the Jewish survivors um, remembered this affair. And it was part of how the Holocaust and the crimes of the Holocaust intersected with their relationship. Um, so not only is Lisa Lota a good example of a very lower level administrator um, who had things like um, she had the key to the safe in the office. So if gold was confiscated or any valuables from the Jews, she, you know, kept uh, um, watch over that and, and could um, uh, access that. She also could create the labor ID cards, which were life-saving documents um, for the Jews. And there were only really um, two ways um, to survive in that region, either with a labor ID card or to run to the woods to flee to the woods. There were many Jews in the woods. The Bielski partisans were actually in the area. And this is where the um, story of how the everyday um, lives of these administrators intersects um, kind of unexpectedly with um, with the Holocaust, um, they one of the survivors described an outing, um, a recreational kind of outing, a hunting trip in the snow one winter. And you can see here, this was another administrator and just woman standing here with this gun. Um, and on this occasion, um, uh, Lisa Lota Meyer was identified with her boss. They were drinking and they were singing and um, and and laughing and um, 
were um, going out on a Sunday to shoot rabbits in the snow and they couldn't find any rabbits. And so they turned and um, their, their guns um, and shot at the Jews, the Jewish laborers who were trying to clear the path um, and the road of the snow. Next slide. Um, and this is a, a snowy scene right here. This is March 42. These are the Jews being marched through Lida. Again, more private images from the town. Um, Lisa Lotemeyer was stationed in. There's her boss, Hermann Hanweg. This is another German woman. I don't know her name. This is a man, a Jewish man, um, young uh, man actually, uh, accused of, of stealing something and being chased and then driven out of this space here. And he's going to be marched to the end of, of the field here and, and killed and then um, left to, to uh, on display to terrorize um, the community. Uh, here is another woman administrator and she's pulling out from the lineup. They, this is the, the women, they had the power really of um, um, the ability to save Jews as well as, as the power to kill them um, or to um, contribute to their killing as far as the organization of the shootings. Uh, and here, this woman uh, allegedly was was pulling out a, a Jewish, a Jewess, as they called it, uh, who had not um, finished knitting a sweater for her. So it was that that kind of uh, power of, over uh, the lives of Jews. It could be just that random that that she could say, "Oh, this is my hairstylist, or this woman. I would like this woman to work in my office." And so they're part of this kind of um, on the spot selection. Next slide. It turns out, though, that um, as far as uh, violence um, and direct perpetration of the violence, it's the wives of the SS officers and order policemen who, where I found most evidence of of this kinds of you know of shooting, actually shooting Jews and um, and um, uh, participating in the actions with their spouses or in the. Um, uh, in their homes uh, because they used, they had Jewish laborers, for instance. Um, this woman here is on the cover of the book, Gertrude Siegel, she's in Drohobich, Ukraine, and they had Jewish laborers working in her garden. And she and her her mate, who was the Gestapo chief, um, or one of the police chiefs in, in Drohobich, they were sunbathing on their in their villa and on their balcony, and they just um, started to shoot at the at the Jews in their in their garden, and this is the wife of Vera. This is Vera Volhalf, the wife of a famous Order Police Battalion leader. I think on the next slide you'll see an example. Yeah, there she is, and they are socializing, having refreshments. And on this particular day, and she she's hanging out with the men. Um, this was the uh, a clearing in a town in Poland called Mezirzitz, and she was very visible, and there was quite a bit of testimony about her um, taunting the Jews and circulating, and um, I think she even had a camera with her, um, and um, that was very memorable to, <clears throat> to the men in the unit as well as um, the Jews who survived that, that um, uh, uh, deportation to Treblinka that day in that town. Next, next slide. And so I, I wanted to um, move towards the conclusion and 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 just uh, focus a little bit more on the case of of Erna Patry uh, because she goes to this extreme of killing these Jewish children. And as I showed you earlier in the presentation, we have her confession, that document, which is rather revealing. Um, the East Germans were very effective at um, uh, um, in their questioning, and it was a pretty rough interrogation. But it turns out that she confessed. She did not confess to crimes that she did not commit. They did the case um, held up, um, and in fact, when Germany was reunited, uh, reunified, in, um, and the wall came down in '89, her case was reviewed by the German authorities, and she was not rehabilitated. She was released from prison in 2000, uh, or sorry, um, in the early '90s. She died in in the year 2000. Um, she um, confessed to, and, and here you see a wartime picture. This is from her photo album, and that's her carriage. This is their plantation in Western Ukraine. Um, and she, another example too of, of social mobility. She was uh, by training a nanny and grew up in a very, very small town near Airport called Foolsborn. It's about, um, there are about four houses in that village. Um, so this was quite a, uh, a move up for Horst and her husband, uh, sorry, Horst uh, and her, his wife, Erna. So the two of them are sent by Himmler to this plantation. 
And so she's married to this SS officer and her father disagreed with that. He was opposed to that marriage because he was a local rabble rouser. Um, and they go out into this estate and it turns out that the estate is located along the railway line from Lviv, Lviv, uh, Western Ukraine, capital of Lemberg during the war, the German name. Um, and those railway lines are running from Lemberg to Sobibor and Belzets and about 250,000 Jews um, were forced into the boxcars along and traveled along those railway lines. And in 1943, um, the Jews in these transports uh, tried to break out. They knew where they, the rumors were swirling around the, and then they came, through the Polish underground, it became clear that um, that there was uh, mass killing um, going on at this this mysterious facility. They didn't really understand the gassing, but they, they thought it was electrocution actually. In any event, the um, Jews start to try to break out of the boxcars and they are running around um, trying to find refuge on their estate here. Um, and so that poses the question that, that presents Erna and her husband with a certain um, dilemma. What do they do when they find these Jews? Do they bring them to the authorities, to the local station? No, in fact, because he's an SS officer, he's actually authorized to shoot the Jews on the spot on their farm. And so Erna is witnessing this. Um, and then ultimately in September, 1943, she herself um, shoots these um, little, um, these Jewish, these Jewish boys. And in her confession, the East German examiner um, says, how could it be possible that you, Erna, uh, a mother of two children, and you can see uh, her family's there and there's her son, um, how could you shoot innocent Jewish children? And she responded, I am unable to grasp at this time how in those days I was in such a state as to conduct myself so brutally and reprehensibly shooting Jewish children. However, earlier before arriving to the estate in Poland, I had been so conditioned to fascism and the racial laws, which established a view toward the Jewish people um, that I, as I was told, I had to destroy the Jews. And it was from this mindset, Ernest said, stated, that I came to commit such a brutal act. Um, Horst was given the death penalty in 1961 um, and guillotined in 62, and Erna got a life sentence um, in 1962. She was released in 1992, uh, as I mentioned, after Germany was re reunified for health reasons and died in July 2000. But her um, a statement about being a convinced anti-Semite uh, was, um, I mean, I uh, found it very persuasive because it turns out that after she was released from prison, she her legal fees were paid by a SS veterans organization called Stille Hilfe, and that was funded, that was kind of organized by Heinrich Himmler's daughter. And um, so after Erna was released, she went down and visited with uh, with Gudrun Himmler and went for a walk in the Bavarian Hall or hike or walked around the Alps and had a marvelous time. And it was one of the kind of highlights of, of her life. In the book, I explore various explanations for why um, these women were went to this extreme of committing these, these murdering, in this case, um, shooting these Jewish children. Um, and I tend to agree with James Waller, who's a social psychologist, um, who wrote a book called Becoming Evil, How Ordinary People Commit Genocide and Mass Killing. And he stresses the environment and social conditioning that brings out this capability and also stresses that it's a minority that go on to do this extreme killing. At one point, I also had the opportunity to interview a prosecutor who um, worked on these cases, not the Erna Patriot case, but other ones in the book of killers. And I asked him, you know, what, you know, do you think they were um, psychopathic or, you know, how do you describe, explain their killing? And he said, the individuals were not insane. It was the Nazi system that was crazy. Um, and w the reason why many of them were um, acquitted or not, not prosecuted was because um, they, those individuals were no longer a threat to society. Um, they were normal law ab abiding citizens in the new democratic Germany. Um, and they were ostensibly success successful chameleons. After reading thousands of pages of German wartime documents and court records and testimonies, I decided to visit this scene here uh, where Erna Petrie committed her crime. So here's the wartime photo album image from the plantation. And here we are in 2010, it's been some years now and I'm there with my colleagues from the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. 
I wasn't sure what I would find when I got there, and I didn't even know if the place still existed, actually. Um, we found the location on a local map. It was a short trip, taxi trip from Lviv heading north, and we drove parallel in the same railway lines that had taken hundreds of thousands of Polish and Ukrainian Jews to the gassing facilities of Belzec and Sobibor. We turned down the same road that Erna Petrie took that fateful day when she spotted the Jewish boys who had fled from the boxcar. We entered the long driveway leading to the manor, which had changed from a stately home to a decrepit structure overgrown with weeds. The porch was two pillars with a sagging middle, precariously standing on cinder blocks. Given what I knew, the place felt haunted, but to the poor elderly Ukrainians who eked out an existence there, it was home. The gilded ironwork on the terrace where Petri had served cake and coffee was rusting and flaking like brittle bones crumbling at the joints. Clean laundry was hung there to dry. The women living there immediately appeared when they saw us, strangers in city clothes with cameras stepping out of a taxi. We walked a few hundred meters in the direction of the location that was described in the court record as the murder site. It was a strip of forest along a gully that divided two fields. I was moment, momentarily distracted by the scene around me, which was picturesque and peaceful. Fields were being harvested by farmers with horse-drawn plows and by hand, and a crisp, colorful September sunset illuminated the rolling hills and flashed off several of Ukraine's newly restored church steeples. Every acre was being cultivated except for two weedy swaths, an overgrown graveyard and the forested gully. The graveyard was, was an impenetrable mass of thorny bushes, and one could descend into the gully, but the prospect was not inviting. Passers-by threw their garbage there, plastic bags, rags, and booze bottles, or perhaps the rain had carried the waste into this crevice. This is not the only site in Ukraine where mass graves from the Holocaust, the bones, and often personal possessions of Jewish victims lie just a few meters below a surface covered with weeds, empty bottles, and other refuse. I stood there meditating, praying, and thinking about what had happened there and what those frightened Jewish children who whimpered when Erna Petri drew her pistol might have achieved had they lived. I stood there for too long, apparently, a Ukrainian peasant with a wool cap, flannel shirt, and threadbare jacket and mended pants accosted me. It was time for me to go. Hiller's Furies is about how we fail to reckon with the past, not so much as a historical reconstruction or a morality tale, but as evidence of a recurring problem in which we all share responsibility. What are the blind spots and taboos that persist in our retelling of events, in memoirs and in our national histories? Why does this history continue to haunt us, generations and many miles removed in places such as Grishenda? The consensus in Holocaust and genocide studies is that the systems that make mass murder possible would not function without the broad participation of society, and yet nearly all histories of the Holocaust leave out half of those who populated that society as if women's history happened somewhere else. It is an illogical approach and a puzzling omission. And the dramatic stories that I shared with you today of these women reveal the darkest side of female activism. They show us what can happen when women are mobilized for war and acquiesce in genocide. Thank you. Sorry, I had a technical difficulty here. <laughs> no worries, no worries. <laughs> Uh, Wendy, thank you so much for your presentation. It was, of course, very good. We already knew. And I invite everyone to buy Wendy's book here in Brazil. We have it translated here. It's called Women of Nazism here, a very small title. <laughs> <laughs> so we already have uh, a bunch of questions here, if you oh, have great. time. Mm -hmm. uh, we translated, but uh, I since we had a lot of comments, I couldn't, uh, I don't think I can put the comments here below, so I'm going to just read it to you. Okay. Is that okay? Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, Maria Fernanda is asking, how was maternity-related actions mm -hmm. during the Holocaust? Is there any documents relate of the sons of the perpetrators? Can we analyze the impact of their mental configuration or their mental health? Hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Um, there were, well, first of all, um, a couple of questions in, in that question that are yes. uh, 
one is about the maternity issue, um, right? And this this was this was brought up in the case of um, Vera Volhauf. Um, and the second question uh, had to do with psychological tests, potentially trying to figure out whether or not they were um, what they're uh, if they could be described as clinically, you know, sociopathic or um, um, you know, did they go on to kill? Like, were they serial killers? Were they were they th those kinds of um, violent types? So on the first question um, about the role of kind of maternity, it's a great question because, first of all, I have a colleague who has done some excellent work, and I, I want you to take a note. Her name is Alyssa von Yoden Forgey, F-O-R-G-E-Y. And when I published my book, we had a couple of conversations about this, and she pointed out something that I didn't really see. I thought that... Um, the women like Erna Patrie, or there was another woman in the, in the book, uh, Johanna Altfather, who was a secretary, who was notorious for killing babies and um, by bashing them against the ghetto wall. She went into the infirmary and she went to the children's section in the infirmary. Um, and also other cases in which, you know, Erna kills those children. And I thought they were just, um, that was, they were demonstrating their violence um, through the most vulnerable. They were the most, you know, they could because those children kind of um, trusted them. Uh, when those Jewish boys were shot by Erna Patri, before she carried that out, she, uh, she allegedly brought them into her kitchen and kind of calmed them down. So I thought it was part of this perverted um, dynamic. Um, in the case of Vera Volhauf, she was, uh, that was a very controversial discussion of her participation because at the time she was pregnant. Um, and the men in the unit, uh, Chris Browning has studied very closely and as well, um, Daniel Goldhagen, they were saying after the killing action that it was just uh, an, an affront to them. It was um, shameful. It was it was causing kind of a kind of cognitive dissonance to see this as a pregnant woman running around participating in this in this violent way in this in the midst of this kind of pogrom. <clears throat> Um, I actually, so as part of the discourse, so how could a pregnant woman, right? Or when the interrogator says, how could you, a mother of two, right? Erin Petrie kill these children. So the maternal piece of this seems like it's inconsistent with the violent part of it. But in fact, um, uh, two things. First of all, Vera Volhauf was pregnant, but I actually looked into her personnel file and she was uh, like six weeks pregnant with her first child. Uh, at that time of that um, uh, action, as the Germans called it. And so the men were talking about her as if she was like nine months pregnant, like on full display and that everybody knew. People knew she was pregnant it, because she ultimately had a child and she was part of that community and her mate was their boss. Um, and she was out there on her honeymoon with him. Um, but she wasn't visibly pregnant at six weeks on, with her first child, but it just became part of this, the 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 discourse on this. Um, and, and like the other uh, women I described, um, they're uh, notoriously killing the children. And Alyssa von Jordan Forge says, um, actually that this, this kind of behavior, she says, is an exercise in genocidal power in which women sought out the gender appropriate tools um, offered from the richness of the domestic sphere that was rife with abusive possibilities. So there, this is again, back to kind of what is their the context in which they're doing this outside the camp system. It's within their homes, it's in their gardens, in their kind of domain. And um, it's it's not so much that they're killing children, um, Alyssa would say, um, because they can, because they're the most vulnerable. They're doing it because it's part of their kind of domestic setting and their domestic environment. Um, and that's that's the possibility that exists there, right? So it's a slightly um, different argument, which I think is is uh, interesting. Um, and the other the other um, point uh, was about if you can remind me, Maria. Oh, um, was about the psychological. Yes. Yes. Yeah. The psychological mm -hmm. effects. There were some um, in Hitler's Furies. I think I have a section in there, and there's a, a deeper footnote. Um, so when the Nuremberg defendants, um, the those who were tried at the International Military Tribunal, you know, that captured so much attention, these high-ranking leaders, and even before they were um, captured, there were these studies, psychological studies by the intelligence um, organizations like the OSS, trying to figure out like the mind of Hitler and 
Um, what's going to happen next? And who are these fanatics? And how can we denazify? How can we deprogram these fanatics? So that was part of the um, incentive for looking at their psychology. Um, and women were among them. I mean, the, the Kempners, who he was a prosecutor there, and he was a German national, uh, come back from America to be in the Nuremberg trials. And uh, he and his wife published a book um, in which they you know, said there were millions of women who were part of the movement who were fanatics. And so women were definitely part of the discussion um, early on and also the discussion of how to kind of denazify them. And they were subjected, some of these um, defendants were subjected to Rorschach ink tests. And some, you know, so this was the age of kind of psycho emerging psychoanalysis and psych psychological studies. Um, and they were then um, applied to some of these defendants. Um, but um, yeah, I didn't, they, they didn't, they didn't, they weren't conclusive, those studies, as far as identifying, you know, who, who, who would be a typical perpetrator or who not. Um, uh, so it's, it's not, you know, um, I can only describe to you that these studies were done, but I, I can't, they weren't really, um, really convincing studies. It was more experiments on their um, psychological uh, state. But I, I did look into, uh, I was curious about these cases, um, post-war cases, and um, trying to, to see if those who were um, arrested after the war in the two Germanys, if anyone like serial killers or any kind of um, offenders after the war, was this a continuity from the war? And I only found one case of a German man who was a um, serial killer in East Germany, was poisoning children, and he um, already acted out his violence during the war. That was his, like, that was, he was, <laughs> Um, had all those possibilities um, to do that. And so he was um, responsible for, for killing POWs um, pretty horrifically in 41. And that's why he was um, brought into the courtroom eventually. But he had this other post-war um, history of, of being violent that came out during the investigation. But that was a very rare case. So, um, yeah. So it's important, to, this is why the prosecutor told me how important the context is of the um, Nazi regime and then the free democratic Germany and how that completely changed people's behavior, including becoming more, more peaceful and less violent. Yes, that's actually very interesting because of the Nuremberg trials, like you said, they really tried to put the Nazis in that box like psychopaths and they applied tests for to see if they were crazy and stuff like that. This was very common at the time. So I have another question here. I can I can show you. Okay, Professor, can we make some links between the role of women under Nazi regime and the image of women <clears throat> in the Nazi cinema? Oh yeah, that's a great great question. Um, well, I guess it depends. You know, on some of there's so many different films during the Nazi era. I mean, there's. Um, uh, I'm thinking of one like Jacques Hughes and, and different uh, feature films that Goebel sponsored and, you know, mostly presenting them as, you know, um, kind of Hollywood starlets and, and innocent, the, the mostly is consistent with a lot of the propaganda that they're supporting the men. You know, it still has this very kind of um, patriarchal, uh, uh, the woman who's, um, you know, um, serving the Fuhrer in a kind of biological way, um, as far as, you know, having many children and, um, being, um, up, an upright citizen and a devotee of Hitler. Um, and also, um, images of women through say Lenny Riefenstahl is so important, um, at this time as a, as a, prominent female um, cultural leader, if you want to call her that, in the uh, during the Nazi regime as a filmmaker. Um, and of course, she did these pretty um, uh, amazing technical films and also kind of nature films and was this kind of pioneer. So you also have the woman who's skiing and is really robust and strong and um, you know, independent. So it's, again, when I think of the picture of, of Erna with these kinds of hybrid forms of the very um, strong German woman, but also, you know, that um, within this patriarchal uh, context, still, still lesser than the male, still defined by her biology. And that's her main contribution as, as one of, like Hitler said, our fellow combatants, their role is to, 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 to breed, you know, to bring babies to the Fuhrer.
Okay, so do you have the time to, to so we can make more questions? Sure. Okay, because <laughs> we have a lot of them. Okay. Um, I'm trying to select them. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so, Professor, women have been known to play a vital role in the white supremacist movements to this day. Mm -hmm. Do you mm -hmm. think there's still a hesitation to study the role of women in such movements? It's so white. Well, um, when I was working on this, there was not that much out there. There was a really good study by Catherine Blee on women in the KKK in America and some emerging studies on women in the Stalinist um, organization and the movement um, and that totalitarian regime and that terror apparatus. Um, so I, I think, and there's some uh, work done on women in, in uh, uh, Mussolini's Italy. Um, but I uh, only recently was on a program with a woman named Sayward Darby um, uh, a couple of years ago, and her book just came out last year on women in these um, currently in the um, far right here in America and the white supremacist movement. She was kind of interviewing them and following them around and all of that. So I highly recommend Sayward Darby's work. She published a an article first in the Atlantic. You can find it on the internet, so you can get kind of get the thrust of her argument and some of her evidence there. But the, you know, I definitely recommend the book. Um, a few weeks ago, I was um, interviewed by someone, especially after the insurrection here in, in America, um, when we saw many women um, leading that insurrection and um, their ideological proclivities and their also their violent tendencies and extremism. Um, <clears throat> so there's absolutely yeah, there's more work going on there. Uh, a little bit more um, in America on the history of lynching and violent racism, um, systemic racism and the kind of plantation system here. More work has been done on that as well, um, going back to the late 19th century uh, and, and the importance of women's um, uh, presence and their, and their contributions there. So uh, it has been slow um, going, but I think it's picking up steam. And I think, you know, that the fact that we are in a situation now where right-wing extremism is really on full, in, on full display and has get has gained this momentum, and it's been going on for for decades now with the um, tea, um, uh, you know, Tea Party movement and, and people like Michelle Bachman and Sarah Palin and and now um, uh, uh, Marjorie Green and you know, so uh, we've you know there are some cases now that are making it more visible. And so people are looking at scrutinizing this a little bit more. And most of it, the work that's being done on this is of late is journalistic. But I, I, uh, I think we're going to see more academic studies on this. Uh, there is a question here that I think is very good. How much do you think that the media influence in how we see the women during this time? Oh, that's a, a huge, huge influence. Um, if there is a dominant, um, a kind of trope, a kind of dominant image, like the Nazi propaganda images um, that were so uh, prevalent um, and even persisted, you know, into the post-war period of the woman as the kind of nurturer. Um, and that, you know, that, that was a kind of thing that was just appearing as an illustration in a textbook without any commentary. It was just people just kind of, you know, just bought into it really. Um, and I think now um, there's just a better critical uh, uh, examination, both because media studies has developed a more critical eye. And I think that people are, are uh, realizing too with this Holocaust research, um, when we get to these cases of really violent women that it just doesn't match up with that. So it, you know, raises all these questions, um, which is, you know, what, why I, uh, worked on this on this book, um, but absolutely, um, and continues to because as I started out with the image of the camp guards that are apps that came out of the journalistic coverage, the British newspapers, the um, Allied newspapers of these you know crazed camp guards with you know tattooed um, skin lampshades and um, and it, just the imagery of them they look you know, kind of crazed or even the, even the movie, the reader is, is a weird depiction as a distortion of uh, an ordinary uh, German female camp guard. And she's illiterate and she's, you know, and the sex comes into that as well. She's having that relationship with that young man. And somehow that's like helping us understand why she, um, you know, allowed that atrocity to happen at the end of the war with the, at the church, you know? And so that, that whole, 
um, uh, film uh, version of that was also playing into these depictions. Yeah. Uh, we have a question here that I'm going to put just a part of it, but Professor, thank you for your talk. I would like to I would like to ask you if you see the medical pathological discourse such as mental instability or hysteria as a way to discharge women from their responsibility mm -hmm. of being part of the mm -hmm. Nazi crimes. Absolutely, absolutely. Because if you are again, if it's this emotional, even you know, um, eroticized, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, that kind of drive, if that's the driver, if it's not, then um, you don't have to take them very seriously, do you? They're kind of freaks. So um, that's different from what I was finding the evidence as far as women who were had these very strong convictions, who were, um, you know, nationalists, fascists, you know, um, uh, anti-Semites, um, and also their various motivations, ambitious, you know, um, trying to climb the, <laughs> trying to climb the modern bureaucracy, part of the modern system, um, trying to show off their, 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 um, strength, uh, vis-a-vis -vis the other women or the other men. Uh, so yeah, if, if we get away from this kind of explanation of, you know, hysteria or eroticized, um, kind of behavior, that's just, that's going back to the biological explanation. And, um, and that's not, um, accurate for this, for explaining the Holocaust um, in this way. So, yeah, and this history. Uh, like five people maybe asked about diaries, if they are a good source or a good research for studying Nazi women, if you have any tips, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, there aren't that many diaries, unfortunately, that I was able to uncover. And there's uh, Melita Moshman. I mean, there are a few and the letters that I got from Annette Schuching Holmeyer. Um, so you do, you have to get into these so-called ego documents, these personal accounts, these personal narratives to really understand, um, these themes of, of their motivation, of their ambitions, um, and to take them seriously, you have to go to their, the, what the things that they're writing and also to understand the dynamic between the men and women. Cause that's another argument in my book is that it's not women's history and men's history. It's the, the two are acting in a way to both escalate and deescalate. I mean, the, the, the marital relationship, the courtship, the dynamic between men and women, men showing off their masculinity, women trying to prove themselves to the men, and this kind of dynamic can, um, um, aggravate, you know, can increase the violence, but it can also, there are cases of men and women working together as, as resistors, you know, that they're, they have a shared value that's actually a more positive um, contribution uh, to the history. So there are, diaries are tough to find. Um, uh, memoirs really were instrumental for me. Uh, the last slide I, that we kind of blipped over at the end was a, a funny little mix of, of memoirs that I used, because um, it, it turned out that um, as I was writing this, a lot of these women were um, late in their in, in their years, and their families were encouraging them in them to write down their memoirs of their having experienced the most dramatic century historically in Germany, and encouraged to, to write down their um, stories. And small presses in Germany were publishing them, um, and I read a lot of those, uh, and that's how I was placing some of these women in these locations, and then I would. Um, follow up by, you know, once the memoir said Ingel Ingelina Rodewald, who's in the book, she's a teacher in Poznan, she's writing in her memoir um, how, you know, tough it was to be in this one room schoolhouse on this frontier, right? And then, but, but not divulging like what we would say kind of Holocaust history. But then if you place her memoir, you know, the location of her school and her story in Holocaust history and the source we have a Holocaust history, then you see that. It, there was a camp across the street, and and in fact, her you know her story does intersect with the Holocaust, and then would follow up and ask her questions. So memoirs are a great way to also start piecing together the story, and also trying to identify your subjects, and then potentially follow up with them and their family members to get access to more personal private archives. Um, we have a question more about the Nazi regime. How do you see the feminine institutions that already existed, for example, in the NS Frauenschaft and the way they played a role in the <coughs> Nazi regime? Mm. Yeah. 
Uh, well, very important in several respects. First of all, it's a it's a total revolution. So everything, the thing that was most exciting about it really, or, or exciting for the German community, the Volksgemeinschaft, as it was called, was this kind of sense of unity and purpose. Um, and that everyone, including the youth, were involved in this revolution. And so those women's organizations um, were kind of, um, you know, stitched into all of this, <laughs> um, whether they were welfare workers or they were in these support roles or they were um, coming out into the streets and, and participating in these parades and flag raising ceremonies or going to the camps. So that kind of activism of involvement um, in which women would say, you know, I want to, I want to become somebody. I want to make something of myself. They had that sense already, um, that idealism and that um, drive. And so, all these party organizations are part of their realization of that like, um, and making it exciting. Um, and that then provides a kind of gloss um, for the realities of the really horrific, you know, dark side of all of this. Um, so, women were important for creating that kind of legitimacy, um, a sense that this was. Um, uh, uh, a worthwhile kind of revolution that, you know, there was going to be, uh, Germany was going to be the land of milk and honey and they were going to be working the fields. And, you know, so uh, that provided that. Uh, also, they provide a lot of moral support to the killers, uh, which um, Claudia Kunz has written about extensively. So um, these are all part of the context, part of the, the energy and the um, ideas. And they're, yes, they're part of, Part of that um, phenomenon. Um, I'm gonna put like maybe more two questions and then we can okay. we can finish. Ooh. This one I think is really good. Um, seeing mm. the example of Hannah Patrice, did you think these women perform socially imposed gender roles to minimize their penalties? Mm. Yeah, um, in the it's a great question from Raphael. Thank you. I like your picture. Um, yeah, so we see this in the interrogations. How they're very much aware of um, their audiences, um, you know, their interrogators, and how they can kind of play up um, those those prejudices. So, um, you know, whether it was drama on our part or, or whether it was genuine or not. I, I mean. Lisa Lotomara was crying <clears throat> when she was questioned about her former boss. Um, and the prosecutor made a little note in the file, like, oh, she was crying, you know, um, this is this nice woman and she was upset. And um, so, you know, treating them in a way, uh, not really taking them seriously um, as far as what they might be capable of doing. And the women kind of playing into that by bringing up for instance, their pregnancy, that's, that comes up several times in the interrogation. So uh, I was pregnant or, you know, um, or I had a small baby, so why I couldn't have done that. And so that's, yes, they are very much aware of how they might be able to um, uh, respond to the questions in a, that, that would cast them in that light, in that favorable light and play into the prejudices of the interrogators who were almost 99.9% .9 of the time were men. Um, so, yeah. That was rather, they were con conscious of that, definitely. It's part of their d defense strategy. Um, this one, another people also ask, do you believe that the anti-Semitic speech reinforced the sexist concept of Nazism? Huh. Yes, there are intersections there. That's a great question of the intersection of gender and anti-Semitic ideology. Of course, Part of that education they had in the school system was to portray Jews as um, preying on innocent German women and their purity, and that they were, excuse me, that they were going to be kind of corrupted or, um, you know, tainted by by the the touch or the interaction of of the Jewish man. And, and there's some horrific caricatures of Jewish men or even doctors, um, you know, when they were instituting the ban on Jer Jewish doctors that they shouldn't be examining um, German women because they were going to be uh, sexually assaulted or something. So um, there's quite a bit there um, of, of that of that trope um, that we see gender and anti-Semitism, um, the intersection of that. That's the first thing that comes to mind, but um, it's a good question because there's, there's probably, if I think about it a little bit longer, I'll probably can 
recall another uh, example of that. Yeah. Uh, I think in relation to that, uh, how the Boon, Boon Deutsche Medal influenced the murderous behavior of mm -hmm. this woman? Yeah, that's another good question. First of all, there um, the bonding that goes on, the kind of camaraderie, the female camaraderie, and the peer pressure that we see in other organized kinds of paramilitary organizations, because kind of that's what it was. I mean, it was um, not only teaching women, young girls, how to cook and sew and and know the the Nuremberg laws and and child care child rearing courses and how to find the proper mate and some kind of mating um, system um, but also they were put into physical training I mean they had actual they had some they had these air rifles but they were actually you know especially later on because some of the women were brought into like air defense um, kinds of uh, military operations at the very end. So yeah, there was also this physical part of it where they were supposed to be, um, their health was also about their physical strength and prowess. Um, and that was inculcated, that was actually um, experienced during these these years in the Bay Day M, yeah. Okay, so I think we had so many questions already. <laughs> I don't well, wanna take so much of your time. Uh, well, thank you so much. I um, appreciate that the questions are just terrific. Um, I wish we had more time and that I could interact with everybody more. I don't, I can't see everybody on the screen, just the questions, but um, I want to congratulate you on these excellent questions and your interest in this history. It's, it's really impressive. Uh, we want also to thank you so much for speaking with us here today. We learned a lot and as we talked to you before, we're going to upload this video later with, with Portuguese subtitles for more people to learn about this. Um, do you have anything else that you want to say? We're very happy. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I just I want to say um, thank you and also um, encourage you to continue to do this research. Um, it's a global history. Uh, and there's Brazil has a part in this as well, as far as immigration, both of Jewish uh, victims slash survivors and and perpetrators uh, who ended up in Brazil. So um, yes, it's it's there's a lot of missing history that you know that's in your archives and uh, it, within the literature in your country of memoir literature. And um, just uh, encourage you to um, examine that a little bit more closely as as well. Yeah, that's actually really good, especially in the times that we are living right now. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much, Wendy. Please. You're welcome. Anytime. <laughs> Next time I'll do it on time. Today was a bit strange. <laughs> no. I want to thank everybody because I, I did get my second jab. I got my second vaccine, which means the next time I'll hopefully be able to travel to Brazil. <laughs> yes, and we are so very happy for you to getting your vaccine. We wonder <laughs> when we will have our vaccine also. <laughs> if I could send it to you, I would. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Wendy. Okay. Please take care. You're welcome anytime. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bye bye. Obrigada, gente. Obrigada a todo mundo que assistiu. Não conseguimos responder todas as perguntas, porque tinham de verdade muitas. Eu tentei pegar umas aqui melhores, mas enfim. É, muito obrigada a todo mundo que assistiu. E amanhã a gente tem mais. Temos mesas de centros começando às duas horas da tarde. Temos uma mesa docente às seis horas da tarde, falando sobre nazismo e neonazismo, inclusive, um tema super atual. Acompanhe as nossas redes sociais, né, Pátio FMG, para saber mais da programação do evento. Vai rolar durante a semana toda. Então é isso, um beijo e até a próxima, gente. Tchau, tchau.